Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. Today's webinar uh, on biodefense and infectious disease uh, is the third in our series, in our summer school series. Uh, I'm happy that uh, happy that uh, you're all able to attend. I see we got a great a great group of people here. A uh, big group, a large group from all around the world. So uh, uh, I'm very happy to see you all here. Thank you. Thank you for attending. We'll be starting in a minute. I'm just having a slight technical difficulty here. Okay, I believe I believe we're okay. We're ready. Everybody's here. Uh, actually, more people are still attending. Okay, well, everybody's here. Uh, we'll get started so as not to keep anybody waiting. So, thanks for attending. Like I said, this is uh, Free Mind Summer School, third in our series of summer school topics. And today's topic is biodefense and infectious disease funding opportunities. I will be discussing uh, all different sources of funding, all different sources of non dilutive funding. Um, we have lots of useful information, examples of funding opportunities, including one which was announced today and is due uh, submission in August. So uh, stay tuned for that. Very interesting and exciting opportunity. Uh, my name is Stuart Jakobowitz. I'm Director of Business Development here at the FreeMind Group, and I'm delighted to be presenting today's webinar. To learn more about us, the FreeMind Group, you could visit our website, freemindconsultants.com. You can see it at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and to keep up to date on the latest non-dilutive funding, you are cordially invited to follow us on Twitter and YouTube, as well as join our LinkedIn group, Non-Dilutive Funding for Life Sciences R&D. So today, like I said, the third in our series, third of eight, we've already covered SBIRs, STTRs, uh, we covered R01s, R21s, and today we're doing biodefense. If you missed any of the past uh, webinars, they're available on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can have the recording. Uh, if you'd like a slide deck of it, you can send me an email. I'll have my email uh, address on the last slide, uh, or you could find me also on our website. Uh, so send me an email, and I'm happy to send you uh, the recording, link to the recording, and the slide deck. Uh, and of course, feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Uh, we have uh, a number of great uh, webinars coming up every Wednesday for the next five weeks. So uh, make sure to register. Register early uh, and spread the word to your friends uh, so uh, they can also benefit from all this, uh, this information. Um, a little bit about the FreeMind Group, uh, who we are, what we do. Sorry about that. Getting used to the mouse here. Yeah, uh, mouse infected mice. Is that a biodefense issue? I don't know. Stay tuned. Um, currently, um, FreeMind Group, we've been around for about 16 years, founded in 1999. We have 45 full-time employees, uh, and uh, we help all different clients from, uh, from academics. We work with all different universities, Duke University, Stanford. We work with uh, medical research centers, um, Mount Sinai. We also work with uh, companies, small and large, starting from small companies, one or two people working out of their living room. Or dining room, sometimes even working out of their kitchen, uh, all the way up to mid-size and large-size companies, uh, and uh, we work uh, to help them maximize their non-dilutive funding opportunities. Uh, our main objective is really to get you help you get as much money as possible from non-dilutive sources, and we work across life sciences, focusing on uh, various government agencies and institutes such as the NIH, National Institute of Health, DoD, Department of Defense as well as many other government organizations, such as BARDA, uh, DITRA, 
um, CDC, FDA, NSF, and we'll, we'll and more, but we'll touch on a bunch of them uh, today. In addition, we also, when it's relevant, work with private foundations. Uh, we we currently have, uh, as I told you, 45 full-time employees, and uh, we submit anywhere from 300 to 350 applications uh, every year uh, on behalf of our clients. Now, obviously, that's a great deal of experience over all these years, uh, and I think uh, that's a large part of what uh, contributes to our success because we put a lot of experience into every application that we work on with each client we work with. The way we work is we work a tool. Uh, we're basically a tool to help you maximize your non-dilutive funding potential. When we start working with client, first thing we do is we identify the most relevant funding opportunities. And that's a really important step because if you have great science but you apply for a grant that's not relevant to your science or you use the incorrect mechanism, you will not be successful despite the fact that your science is really deserving of funding. So our analysts uh, create a list of opportunities based on the information that you, you've given them and discussed with them. And together with you, they create a strategy, or we'd like to call a multi-submission granting strategy. We do this in order to maximize your chance for winning an award. We also manage complex project production process. We lead the joint application writing process because we, we can't do this alone. You're the experts uh, in your science, and we'll never know it as well as you do. So we do need you on board in this joint effort. Also, when it's relevant uh, in, the, in the contract, which we'll discuss later also an example, we support the final contract negotiations. Now, we're talking here about a pocket of money of about $50 billion in non-dilutive funding of the life sciences from U.S. sources. Now, for the purpose of today's webinar, you see in front of you on the, on the slide uh, all many different agencies from the NIH to 27 institutes and other HHS agencies, DOD, foundations, and more. But for our, our purpose, the ones that are highlighted in red are the ones that are really uh, most appropriate for our, our topic today. Um, so we're going to be focusing on NIAID, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, BARDA, U.S. Army, DARPA. We're not going to really talk about CDMRPs, although they are really a great, uh, a great source of funding because, unfortunately, this year's deadline is already passed. So make sure that when the next round is announced, and the typically around March and April, um, make sure you, you, uh, you're aware of them and you take advantage of another great opportunity for funding. Uh, and the private foundations, the main player uh, in infectious disease is, as I'm sure you, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who we've worked with. It's interesting to note that out of the $50 billion dollars Allocated to funding the life science is a major portion of that, or a little over $30 billion, $30.36 billion. I guess when it's a billion, the 0.36 does make a difference. So a little over $30 billion comes from the NIH. Uh, the NIH budget is currently, as we said, $30.3 billion, uh, and a very large portion of that is or somewhere $26 billion devoted to extramural research, such as research project grants and R&D contracts. And in case $50 billion is not enough, last week the U.S. House of Representatives passed a bill known as the 21st Century Cures Act, which adds $8.75 billion over the next five years for medical research and is expected to overhaul drug development and innovation in order to get life-saving cures to people who need them faster. So in case... $50 billion enough, we're, we're closing on, we'll be closing in another few years on $60 billion in, in funding. What we see here on this chart is that a significant amount of NIH spending is allocated to infectious diseases. Now, important to note that, that, that in this graph, these numbers do overlap. We're not saying that there's $5 billion allocated for infectious disease and an additional $3 billion for, for HIV and another $2 billion for emerging Infectious disease, obviously there's overlap here, which just gives you an idea that among the, the, the uh, ailments funded uh, by NIH, the infectious disease is a, a significant uh, uh, amount of money uh, that's allocated here. And it's also nice to see, as you see here, that infectious disease awards are on the rise. Now, yes, it looks like a, a very small increase. But when you're talking about these big numbers, uh, you know, every million dollar counts. So that's, that's certainly uh, positive as far as uh, dealing with uh, infectious disease and, and funding for the research. 
NAID the NIAID mission is to conduct and support basic and applied research to better understand, treat, and ultimately prevent infectious immunologic and alert diseases. As such, they, as you see, they invest quite a bit of money, or you have grants and contracts uh, in order to, to deal with the, with the, the NIAID uh, um, subjects and uh, focus. One important and growing area of interest to NIAID is emerging infectious diseases or pathogens. These could be defined as infectious diseases that have newly appeared in the population, or they've existed rapid, but are rapidly increasing in incidence or geographic range, or they're caused by one of the NIAID's category A, B, or C priority pathogens. These include biodefense research and a whole collection of additional emerging infectious diseases and pathogens. I've listed here a sampling of a few of the infectious diseases and pathogens targeted by NIAID, for a complete list, you can either contact me or you can look at the NIAID website, but keep in mind that this uh, priority list is periodically reviewed and re revised in conjunction with other federal partners, including the Homeland Security and the CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. As you see here, we have three uh, the type A, B, and C, so category A, B, and C. So category A pathogens, just to give you a little, a little background on what that means, uh, you see these examples, but cather category A pathogens are those organisms or biological agents that pose the highest risk to national security and public health. Category B pathogens are the second highest priority, and ca category C is the third highest priority and includes emerging pathogens that could be engineered for mass dissemination in the future. But again, for more information, uh, more details, check out the NIAID uh, website. Uh, and uh, it's all it's all there. Now, non dilutive funding opportunities are broken broken down into various funding routes. I'll give examples of all these later. But here we see solicited opportunities. Now, solicited opportunities are just as they sound, where uh, where the agency or institute lists a specific solicitation uh, asking for uh, research in a very specific area. Great opportunities, and and uh, you can either Google or or whoever you work with can help you find all of these uh, all of these opportunities, wonderful opportunities. Uh, if if you could find um, something, an opportunity that fits your your research, is then unsolicited or investigator initiated opportunities, also known as omnibus solicitations. These are really important because these are really general uh, solicitations. It's a general solicitation for research to deal with unmet medical needs. And with the NIH, each institute has its own uh, medical needs, own things they're looking for. In order to, to uh, take advantage or to apply for one of these unsolicited opportunities, you really need to speak to the program officer in order to, to explain what you're looking to do and to see if what your, your research, your project fits in with what, uh, what they're uh, looking to fund. This is a really important uh, uh, part of, uh, of your non-dilutive funding strategy uh, because about 70% of the NIH awards uh, go towards these unsolicited or investigated initiated opportunities. And third here, we list BAAs, uh, broad agency announcements. Now, there are a lot of work, uh, hefty documents, but they really are very worthwhile, as we'll, we'll, we'll come and discuss uh, soon more about them. But because these grants offer offer a lot of money. Uh, it's also been found that uh, because they're so hefty and so much work, it's really hard to prepare for these and to, to be successful at submitting these without any external assistance. Now, I do know on the bottom about contracts and grants. Uh, contracts and grants, um, just a, a quick word about them. Grants are basically money from the government they're trusting you for the most part. Uh, a little bit of reporting, but not a lot. If you win the grant, of course. Uh, but once you've won a grant, it's not easy to take it away, and there's not too many strings attached to a grant. A contract, on the other hand, is as it sounds. It's a contract you sign with the government, and you're agreeing to carry out certain scientific activities. Uh, now, you have to do this on time and budget. These contracts have a little more restrictions and more strings attached. However, the funding could be very substantial, so even though it's sometimes more work or a little bit uh, more restricted, uh, it's not something that you really want to overlook. 
So as we said, NIAID supports extramural research focused on understanding, controlling, and preventing diseases caused by virtually all infectious agents. So let's first look at some examples of solicitations for preclinical funding opportunities, and then we'll follow with some clinical stage funding opportunities. First, up first at bat first, we have here the R01 Research Project Grant, partnerships for the development of host targeted therapeutics to limit antibacterial resistance. Now, R01 is a great mechanism, and if you, you attended our webinar last week, you heard all about R01s and R21s, and you heard that despite what most people think, it's not only for academics. But we're not going to get into details about what the R01 is or isn't. And if you, if you heard the webinar last week, great. And if not, uh, it's available on our website or our YouTube channel. Or again, if you can't find you can always email me and I'll send you the slide deck uh, as well as a link to the recording. Now, the purpose of this funding opportunity announcement, or FOA, is to solicit research applications for milestone-driven projects focused on preclinical development of, candidates, of, of candidate therapeutics, which target host-encoded functions required for infection, replication, virulence, proliferation, and or pathogenesis of selected bacterial pathogens for which drug resistance poses a significant public health concern. Yeah, it's a mouthful, but it's really a great opportunity. And in fact, NIAD intends to commit $11.5 million in fiscal year 2016, uh, and they, they plan on funding anywhere from 10 to 15 awards. Uh, budget for this uh, uh, includes uh, direct costs of up to $750,000 per year, uh, and it could be. Uh, and the scope of the project should determine the project period, but uh, the maximum period is up to five years. $750,000 a year for up to five years. The applicants could also request, and this is very uncommon with grants, and we rarely see it but they could also request an additional $300,000 in the first year of the award for major equipment to ensure that research objectives can be met and biohazards can be maintained. So if you need a piece of equipment, and, and of course it has to be equipment that's appropriate and relevant to your project, but if you need a piece of equipment uh, in addition to your research, this is really a great uh, solicitation because when you add it all up, potentially worth more than $4 million that's in direct costs. So on top of that, you also get indirect costs. This is really a great opportunity. Uh, deadline is coming up fairly soon, September 17th. So uh, I suggest that uh, if this is something relevant for you, you get started as soon as possible. Uh, now, this opportunity is, by the way, it's, it's you're eligible whether you're a U.S. entity or a non-U.S. If you're a foreign entity, you are also, you are also eligible to apply for uh, for this, uh, this opportunity, this solicitation. Next we have is another R01 research grant, Partnership for Development of Novel Assays to Predict uh, Vaccine Efficacy. The, pr the purpose of this is to solicit applications for projects focused on development or improvement of preclinical assays to predict human efficacy for specific investigational vaccines. This one has a little bit less uh, um, committed by NIAD. They commit here $6.3 million uh, in 2016, fiscal year 2016, and they expect to uh, fund here also five to 10 awards. So, and this, like the last one, uh, allows for direct cost of up to $750,000 a year for up to five years, as well as $300,000 in year one for that Harley, I mean, for, for major equipment, uh, which is another uh, potentially $4 million plus uh, opportunity. And here they're giving you even an extra, another extra few days till September 30th uh, for the deadline. Here too, non-US as well as US uh, entities are eligible to apply. Here we have a U01 or a cooperative grant, which is entitled Countermeasures Against Chemical Threats, also known as Counteract. Cooperative Research Projects. A cooperative agreement is a very valuable mechanism, and it's used when there'll be substantial federal scientific or programmatic involvement. This means that after the award, NIH staff will assist, guide, coordinate, or participate in project activities. That's really a great thing to have them, uh, have them on board, have their assistance, knowledge, and, and experience. Now here, uh, unlike the previous ones, which were only from NIAID, 
Uh, this you have multiple agencies participating here, including the NINDS, that's for neurological disorders and stroke, the NEI, the National Institute, the National Eye Institute, NIAID, which is our, our good friend from past slides, uh, uh, NIAMS, the National Institute of Arthritis, Musculoskeletal and Skin Disease, uh, NIEHS, which is Environment and Health Services, Environmental Health Services, and uh, NIGMS for General Medicine. So really, it's it's a good good idea to check out this solicitation if, if any of these. It's a little bit broader than the, the just NIAD. Uh, other agencies, our uh, institutes are participating. Now, the scope or mission of this counteract U01 is to develop new and improved therapeutics for chemical threats. Now, these are for toxic chemicals that could be used in terrorist act or even ac accidentally released from industrial production or storage or shipping. They include traditional chemical water agents, toxic in industrial chemicals, as well as uh, pesticides. Uh, you're encouraged to, to contact the program official listed in the FOA to, to determine if, if your proposed threat agent or countermeasures is a high pro program priority for one of these uh, participating institutes. The scope includes target and candidate identification as well as characterization through candidate optimization and demonstration of in vivo efficacy through IND submission where it's appropriate, of course. And each project must include milestones that create discrete go no go decision points in a progressive translational study. This opportunity has been open for a few years and is expiring after this due date. So September 16th is your last chance. Yes, it may be renewed, maybe, maybe not, but September 16th is, is, is your last chance uh, for, for submitting as it is now uh, for this uh, FOA. Uh, here, application budgets are also not limited, but they need to reflect uh, the actual needs. Um, and here, I'm sorry to say, but non-U.S. entities are not eligible. This is only eligible for U.S. Uh, for US entities. Here you have an SBIR for a uh, small business innovative research grant. Uh, this is an R43, R44 for radiological nuclear medical countermeasures, uh, countermeasure product development programs. Uh, we did have a, a webinar two weeks ago on SBIRs and STTRs. Uh, like I said, it's small business innovative, innovative re innovation research grants and small business technology transfer grants. In case you missed it, of course, it's on our website or our YouTube, or you can email me. I'm happy to send it to you. The purpose of this solicitation is to encourage new or renewal SBR grant applications focused on specific product development activities for radiologic nuclear medical countermeasures leading to IND or IDE submission packages with the FDA. And it supports non-clinical as well as preclinical uh, development activities. Uh, funding here for phase one is up to $300,000 $300, total cost per year for up to two years, and phase two up to a million dollar total cost per year for up to three years. This is much bigger than the typical uh, SBIR grants. It adds up to over the five years, potentially $3.6 million, and that's a, that's a lot of money. And if it's relevant to you, don't miss out. Deadline September 15th. As we all know, SBIRs are only uh, eligible, uh, only available to U.S. entities. Let's move on a little bit to talk about a few uh, clinical opportunities here. I'll start off with the NIAS Clinical Trial Planning Grant. Yeah, that's correct. They give money, they're willing to give money for planning the clinical trial. As you see here, up to $150,000 for one year uh, for planning the grant. And this is for planning for one and only one clinical trial. Uh, and it's, it's just a great way to, to help you um, Establish the research team, design the study, develop complete clinical protocol, develop a statistical analysis plan, and, and more. So it's really great. $150,000 uh, could be very helpful here. Um, Non-U.S. are welcome to apply. They're, they can join in. U.S. as well as non-U.S. Are, are eligible for, for this grant. Once you finish the clinical trial planning, then which we saw in the previous plan, you're ready for the U01 NIAID Clinical Trial Implementation Cooperative Agreement. Now, you're not required to do the planning grant in order to do this. It's there if you want, but again, you can go straight, you can really go straight to this U01 without 
the uh, planning grant. Uh, NIAD strongly does encourage that you consult their program officer at least 10 weeks prior to submission of the grant application. It's not required, but it is encouraged. And uh, this FOA invites cooperative grant applications for implementation of investigator-initiated high-risk clinical trials and mechanistic studies associated with high-risk clinical trials. As, so you see here that this is for high-risk clinical trials, uh, but as you see on the lower left hand, I've, I've noted that there's an R01 companion funding opportunity uh, for low-risk clinical trials. That's, by the way, PAR 13-149. Uh, if you're interested. So these solicitors are great opportunities if you're preparing and you're, you're planning for clinical trials. But as with all opportunities, make sure to carefully read, read the solicitation uh, and check out, uh, in this case, NIAID's Clinical Research Tool Toolkit website for protocol templates and guidance, clinical research resources, and more. And here we're talking about funding uh, of up to half a million dollars for up to five years. September 11th deadline, and U.S. as well as non-U.S. entities are welcome to apply. Here we have an SBIR uh, clinical trial implementation cooperative solicitation from NIAID. This is a U44 cooperative agreement, and it's either for phase two or phase two as in uh, SBIR phase two or fast track, SBIR fast track only. Um, Small businesses or SBCs are invited pro to propose to implement investigator-initiated NIAID-related clinical trials. It supports hypothesis-driven, milestone-driven clinical trials. And although clinical trials which are not considered high-risk may be pro proposed, this program encourages high-risk clinical studies. Mechanistic studies are also encouraged and could be proposed on this program. However, not more than one clinical trial should be proposed with each grant application. A commercialization plan must be included, and this has to detail plans for promoting further commercialization of the product or technology associated with the proposed clinical trial. And here, phase one provides funding of up to $225,000 for one year. Phase two provides up to $1.5 million for up to three years. Uh, and this is total cost, meaning it includes direct as well as indirect costs. And it's this as an SBIR, it's limited to U.S. entities. Uh, and next deadline coming up in September 11th. And as I promised you, Hot Off the Press is just announced today, this broad agency announcement of BAA from NIAID is for development of therapeutic products for biodefense and emerging infectious diseases. Now notice, that unlike previous opportunities, this is a contract, I mentioned before contracts, uh, and it's, it's not a grant. Uh, so the scope of this country of this contract uh, is for the development of therapeutic products for use in post event settings following the intentional release of an IAD category A, B, or C priority pathogen or response to a naturally occurring outbreak of infectious disease caused by an IAD category A, B, or C priority pathogen. It focuses on the development of promisingly therapeutic candidate products uh, and one category of products being solicited are those with broad-spectrum therapeutic activity against viruses or bacterial path pathogens. Solicitation also focuses on supporting development of, of promising antitoxins as therapeutic candidate products, particularly small molecule therapeutics with antitoxin activity. Now, this BA budget is not capped and has to reflect the scope of the work. But the NIAD estimates that two or more awards may be issued for total cost, which is direct and indirect cost, combined for up to $15.3 million in 2016. I wish my colleagues here with her uh, sound effect for the ching. That's, that's a lot of money, $15.3 million for two or maybe more awards. That's a nice, nice award. Uh, period of award is up to, uh, up to five years. Earliest uh, start date uh, is um, actually awards are ex expected to be starting at around June 1st. So we've got to submit them uh, by August 13th. Oh, wow, that's really soon. That's uh, that less than a month. So we got to really get going, whether you're working with us or on your own, whatever it is, if this is relevant for you, get started yesterday, if not the day before. Now, 
So in AHS, there's also BARDA, BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. It's a very interesting agency and really love working with them. They're, they're extremely responsive uh, and they're extremely helpful. We highly recommend that you take advantage of the, they offer a tech watch, which means they'll basically, they'll meet with you, they'll sit down, discuss your science, ask you questions. Uh, and, and based on, on this meeting, they'll suggest to you, they'll recommend uh, if you're ready uh, for BARDA, to submit a BARDA application, which really saves a lot of time. It's also, it's a great source of, of guidance and information, so we really love working with, with BARDA. BARDA's mission is to develop and procure medical countermeasures that address chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear, or CBRN, accidents, and incidents, and attacks, pandemic influenza, and emerging infectious diseases. Here, as you see from this chart, they're trying to bridge the valley of death between NIH preclinical, late stage clinical, and on to licensing production and delivery. So it's really a great opportunity to, to fill in that, uh, that gap, that valley of death. Great thing is also that they're looking to procure because uh, they stockpile uh, because they're, they're looking for these uh, countermeasures. So they stockpile in large quantities um, your uh, your projects when, when you develop the item. So you have, aside from the fund, you also have a built-in customer. And no, I know the question is going to come up. No, it's not exclusive. They do allow you to sell your product um, to other clients as well. Uh, but you have a, a built-in customer. And what business doesn't like to, to have a built-in customer as they're, doing their, as they're doing their work? BART also just got their five-year budget. Uh, their new fiscal year starts on September 1st, so we're expecting a new announcement soon. Uh, and we're also personally, for our clients, waiting to hear uh, some responses from a some applications that we've submitted. Uh, and uh, we're very uh, excited and, and optimistic because based on, on past success, we, we're hopeful and that, that we will have success for our clients well in the future. The way it works generally uh, with the DOD and BARD is you start with a white paper, which ranges anywhere from two to ten pages. It's really a high-level overview of the project. The most critical stage, because most applications don't get past this stage, you have to put a lot of thought and effort into this, uh, because based on this, uh, they will decide if, if you move forward or not. Uh, once uh, once you submit, about 90 days later, you get answered, and if it's favorably reviewed, they ask you to submit a full application, which is usually due 45 to 9 days later. Not a lot of time, because the applications usually are quite uh, quite hefty. So once you get uh, that, that call back to submit a full application, that's it. No more vacations. Get started, get working, uh, and get it done, because these are, are really very valuable. And if you pass that, that white paper stage, then their chances are, are much, much better. Uh, once you submit the full application, then it's reviewed for technical merit uh, in about up to six months. And then you, uh, when you get a response and you enter into stage three of cost negotiations, which, by the way, if you're working with us, we do help, of course, with the cost negotiations. DOD and BARDA have a similar process, although sometimes their the time frames uh, differ. Now, I have a few examples of BARDA uh, but listed here. And while they've expired, uh, we do expect them, as in the past, to be reissued soon. Uh, but it's something that you really should uh, keep track of if, if this, is, this is your field and your products fit in with uh, their scope. BAAs uh, typically have no budget cap, but that doesn't mean you should go crazy and ask for a billion dollars. But on the other hand, you shouldn't be afraid to ask for $20 million or whatever is justified. Important to know you ask what you need, uh, not more and not less, because if you ask for too much or too little, then they'll question and they'll question if, if you really know what you're doing um, and, and it, it lowers your, your chance of success. So ask what you need and have it justified and move forward from there. Now, the DOE Department of Defense has, has a few entities. DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, Best I could describe it, it's, it's like Q from James Bond. They're into high-risk, revolutionary, high-payoff research. DITRA, or Defense Threat Reduction Agency, safeguards the U.S. and its allies from weapons of mass destruction, or WNDs. And USAMARIC, uh, the U.S. The United States Army Medical Research and Material Command, provides solutions to medical problems of importance to the American warfighter at home and abroad. Let's look at a couple of opportunities, and let's start uh, with DITRA. So we see here, uh, 
first thing you see here is the uh, Dietra BAA Fundamental Research to Counter Weapons of Mass Destruction. Uh, and they're really looking to significantly advance revolutionary technology that may have an impact on future WMD threat reduction or capabilities. Uh, and as I said before, there's no budget cap, but it has to reflect the scope of the work. Uh, and here you have rolling deadlines, which means there's no specific deadlines. You, when you're ready, uh, as long as before it expires, you you submit your uh, your application, uh, and uh, and uh, you you get into the process with the white paper and so on moving forward. Next, you have another BAA, also with rolling deadlines, R&D Innovation and System Engineering Office Science and Technology New Initiatives. Again, no no budget cap on this. Uh, and as we said, DITRA is going to identify, conduct, and deliver innovative science and technology that enables uh, America to combat WMDs. Um, they, they're looking to develop uh, 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 and demonstrate effective chemical and biological defense solutions. That includes pretreatments, therapeutics, diagnostics, detection, protection, medical effects, uh, metal, medical effects, modeling, and, and so on. The U.S. Army, or USAMARIC, uh, mission is to provide solutions to medical problems of importance to the American warfighter at home and abroad. The projects have to be for basic and applied research that are part of development, not related to development of a specific system or hardware pro procurement. Uh, projects must be for scientific study and experimentation directed toward advancing the state of the art, increasing knowledge or understanding, rather than focusing on a specific system or hardware solution. So we have an example here with a, uh, a deadline for the pre-allocation coming up in September 30th. Uh, this uh, pre-proposal is required to explore USAMRIC's interest in your research project. The full proposal uh, can be submitted only by invitation. And uh, typically, um, the full proposal, you get about 120 days uh, you get the invitation from when you submit the pre-proposal in 120 days, and you have about another 90 days uh, going forward from there. Uh, and uh, this is to provide solutions to medical problems for the warfighters, we said, uh, military infectious diseases, combat casualty care, uh, and so on. DARPA was established in 1958 as part of the, uh, the DOD to pursue opportunities for transformational change rather than incremental advances. So the mission of the BTO, or Biological Technologies Office, is to leverage biology as a technology to solve intractable problems. They seek to leverage advances in engineering, computer science, to drive and reshape biotechnology for national security. And to achieve this mission, they're interested in a range of emerging technical areas, including human machine interfaces, human performance, infectious disease, and synthetic biologies. The proposed research must enable revolutionary advances in science and technology as a system. Funding here is up to $700,000, and the deadline for your pre proposal is August 28th. So, once again, get moving. Got lots of work to do. I uh, hope you took summer vacation and you can. Uh, get working uh, already. We got another DARPA BAA uh, for biological technologies. Uh, they're looking for innovative research um, and it's specifically uh, excluded is research that primarily results in evolutionary uh, improvements to the existing state of the art. They're really looking for, for something revolutionary here. They want radical new techniques and technologies. Um, here, uh, there are rolling deadlines until April 28, 2016, uh, and funding is also not restricted, but it has to be reasonably justified. So we've shared a good number of, of uh, sample of opportunities, and keep in mind these are only sample opportunities, so if nothing you've seen here is relevant for you, there, there are plenty more uh, out there, just uh, we're limited by time uh, in, in going into all of them. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the process and some of the challenges. So with the opportunity to get to get the larger awards comes a lot more complex applications. As I mentioned, the white paper is really crucial. It's short, but it's really an extremely important document. And it's 
it's often easier to write a long paper than a short one because you have to make sure this short paper is focused, clear, concise, and, and gets your point across. You have to also make sure that you're responsive to the solicitation. You can't just write whatever. You have to really respond specifically to what the solicitation is calling for. And you have to adhere to all the guidelines. I, I can't stress that enough. You need to re read that solicitation and read it again and again. Make sure that all the guidelines, because it, it's the worst thing is when you have great science and you fail to win the award because you didn't follow the guidelines. That's like uh, hitting a home run and then uh, being called out because you forgot to touch one of the bases. I hope um, the non-Americans understand baseball that much. Um, so read the solicitation carefully uh, because each one has its own unique sections. You have to also make sure to, to uh, manage the project and coordinate everything. If you have uh, PIs in different locations, collaboration, make sure everything is coordinated. And you're really dealing with a short timeline, as we saw from uh, from pre-application pre until they want the full application is only sometimes 45, 90 days. So you really have to work uh, quickly. Now, just a quick overview of uh, the review process. This is uh, this is um, the NIH review process, but it's fairly similar to the other agencies, the NSF, DOD, and others as well, uh, where basically uh, they review and, and they consider to fund your application and they weigh the strengths and, and risks. They do is so they look at two things. They will look at responsiveness and competitiveness. Are you responsive solicitation? Because no matter how good your science is, if it's not responsive to the solicitation, you're not going to be reward, uh, awarded or rewarded. Uh, and are you competitive? When we talk about competitiveness, they basically look for five criteria, and they score you on these five criteria. Significance, the significance of your research to public health. Is it innovative? Or are you going to really make a change with your approach, the leadership? Do you have the right people to, to get the job done? The PI and key personnel, they have the expertise and experience. The environment, can you support the work that you propose? For example, do you have the proper lab space for, for the work you'll do? But ultimately, what makes the difference between a good application that isn't awarded, and one that is awarded is your scientific approach. The milestones, the specific goals. Ultimately, top-notch science is what wins awards. For a more broad perspective, uh, I'd like to take a step back and give you an idea of our approach to non dilutive funding and how to maximize your chances for award. First of all, you need to know the interests of the Institute. So what's on their agenda? Now we've, we've discussed some of the different uh, uh, agencies and institutes uh, out there. But you have to really understand what's on their agenda. What are they looking to fund? Uh, what won't get funded because it's not within their scope? And if necessary, you could communicate with the program officers, either directly yourselves or if you're working with us, we, we do it for you. You need to focus the project application. Because a focused application uh, have a, has a much higher chance of being favorably reviewed. Remember, they're not looking to fund companies or labs. They're looking to fund projects. So you don't want your proposal to come across to a reviewer as overly ambitious or unrealistic. Make sure to ask what's necessary. Like I said before, don't inflate 
the budget or do ask, don't ask for too little. Make sure to present a complete project, a comprehensive storyline, and leverage on research collaborations, whether or not the mechanism requires it or in a case where there's a gap in your capabilities, it's important to collaborate. Take on consultants, statisticians, or outsource work you're less proficient at or don't have the expertise to complete. Now, in an effort to maximize your chance for award and to win the largest awards possible, I don't think I can overestimate the importance of targeting the right mechanism. As you saw in various mechanisms I showed, there are many solicitations and many different mechanisms. It's important that you know your way around these mechanisms as they represent more than just letters and numbers. They represent the requirements of the solicitation and the nature of the project the budgetary factors, the cooperation foundation, and, and more. There are many different pockets of money, and you really need to target what's right for your project. It's vital that you understand the different size of awards and success rates, knowing the different funding levels, and match them to your requirements. Of course, you have to conduct a strategic uh, a thorough strategic assessment to see what your objectives are, what research do you have, and what stage of development they're in. What would you like your research to be? Where would you like it to be in the next 12 or 24 months? And what's the potential for success in each of these research projects? All this should be done with the goal of creating a multi-submission granting strategy. Just a couple words about us. Like I said, we're 45 people, analysts, um, writers. Uh, we've been doing this for, for uh, 16 years uh, with, with great success. Uh, and, and all our analysts and managers have great experience and expertise, and they put that into each of your, uh, each of your applications uh, in, in order to increase the chance for, for success. Um, I highlighted here Dr. Seagal Katz because uh, in this particular today's, uh, today's webinar, she was extremely helpful. Uh, so I wanted to thank her uh, for, for her help in, in, in this and in general in, in so many areas. Um, she, she's, been, she's always very helpful. I, I've learned a lot from her and, and continue to learn with her. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, if any of you get the chance to work with her, you'll also uh, enjoy and benefit greatly from working uh, from working with her. Um, there we go. Now, just to summarize what we do, like I said, we offer strategic consulting which, uh, or strategic assessment, and then we actually offer the project uh, production. In strategic assessment, we, we get to understand your, your pipeline of projects, your funding needs, short-term short and long-term. Uh, based on that, we go and uh, our analysts go and find all of the opportunities and, and come up with a strategy, how we're going to work together, how we're going to help you submit as many applications as possible over the time we're working together. Then we actually work together with you to, to write uh, and, and prepare the, the grant application. Like I said, we need you on board. You're a, an important part of the team, uh, but uh, we, we're certainly uh, a, a vital uh, partner in this process and, and help uh, with all of our experience and all of our, our knowledge to make sure um, things go smoothly and uh, coordinated with your various collaborators and, and everything gets done on time. Just a, a schematic to show how, how we work. You start with the R&D funding needs and then based on that we create, like I said, the multi-submission granting strategy, long term as well as short term. Then we work together with you on the grant writing, uh, submit the grants and then and then continue. And as, as, you, as I told you, I think a number of times, we, we have 45 people, so we do have a lot, of, a lot of staff, and we can work, of course, on more than one grant application 
at a time. So we, we leverage, uh, you leverage uh, your time in order to get that much more uh, production and high level, high quality production by working with us. And with that, we've come to an end to our webinar. Uh, it, uh, it's taken a little bit longer than I thought it would. A lot of, uh, a lot of great solicitations that I wanted to, to get into and let you know about. So I was hoping to have a chance for, for questions and answers, but it doesn't look like I have. I, I apologize for that. Um, my email is right there, uh, Stuart at Freemind Consultants. Don't forget that, sconsultants.com. Uh, please email me with, with any comments or questions. Uh, you can also call me. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, you know, to, to speak with, with any and all of you. Uh, I will be sending out to all of you who've registered uh, the, the slide deck as well as a recording. Uh, and uh, I look forward to speaking with you uh, um, in, in the near future to answer your questions and see how I could help you. Uh, move forward. Uh, remember uh, to register for, for next week's webinar. Um, and next week is going to be non dilutive funding for non US applicants, all those people who I said uh, earlier who were not eligible. Uh, so there are plenty of things that you are eligible for. Um, really, oh, most things you really are eligible for. So don't don't lose hope. Uh, so next week's uh, webinar, I'm sure, will be extremely interesting and informative. Again, today's webinar is will be saved on our YouTube channel, uh, and um, uh, feel free to follow us on on Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, and I look forward to to speaking with you and answering your questions uh, and being in, of help in in any way I can. Thank you all for participating. It's really been a pleasure, and uh, I wish you a good day or evening, depending on where you are. Bottom line, I wish you all well.